so that's nice. Um, okay, that is not showing live yet on YouTube. Hang on. There it is. Good. It says upcoming, though. It says schedule. Let me click on live. There, yeah, 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 that's good. That's on YouTube. And then it should pop up on Facebook shortly. If you are here watching us messing about, um, we're just sorting us. There we are. That's that. Let me pin that. Refreshing. Spot. It would be at the top of the feature. Yeah, it's just come up now. I've pinned it now into featured. So okay. if you refresh, you should see it in featured. That's that. Let me pin that. Refreshing. It would. If you're joining us, everyone, it's just uh, we're just a couple of minutes early, and we are just there sorting ourselves out technologically. Uh, have you found it, Heather? Yes, I have. And Excellent. you said to um, click on it so it's a post. Yes. I've yeah. Got that. So when you click on it and you can Voice see. Left to reveal comments and reactions. Yeah. And you can see it says no comments yet. But when people start to comment, then you can scroll back. Hi, Margie. You're the first commenter in Facebook. Uh, Welcome to my channel. Oh, I'm Louise so Fletcher that. Oh, and I help you. don't need that. <laughs> and then I can see everyone in YouTube. That's great. Nice to see you all uh, from all over, from Belgium, from Denmark, from Switzerland, from Pittsburgh, from London, Germany, southwest of England, France, Bangladesh. Wow, Bangladesh. You might be our first Bangladesh student. I'm not sure, but maybe. Copenhagen, Ottawa, Ontario, Orlando, Florida. So lovely to see everyone. Where are you, Heather? I always forget. Where are you? I'm in southern Ontario, just right on the north shore of Lake Ontario in a little town called Coburg. Right. So how far, I, I only really know Toronto and the surrounding area, which where I used to live. How far are you from Toronto? About an hour, about an hour east. Oh, it's not far then. Oh, Toronto. 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 Trana. Trana. If, if you live in Toronto, Trana. it's called Trana. Yeah, Trana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a Westerner, so I don't talk like a Torontonian. <laughs> yeah, I, ne I never mastered that. But um, <laughs> And the A-Land Islands in Greece, I'm sure I've said that wrong. Um, York, UK, Diane, nearer to me. La Visa, Finland, West Wales. Oh, my goodness. Pickering, Ontario. I know where that is. That's not um, from me. Ah, uh, right. OK, because I worked for a chain of record stores called HMV and they had a store in Pickering in the mall there. So we used to, I used to go. I'm there. about halfway between Pickering and Toronto. Right. OK. Uh, so everybody, lovely to see you coming in. We've got we've got a couple of minutes, so I'm not going to start until we get to seven. Today I have with me Heather Stubbs, another one of our wonderful coaching team. And Heather. Um, Tell us, if you don't mind, I'm putting you on the spot now, and I don't know if you can remember, but when you did this taster course and you got to the ugly painting, can you remember what that was like for you? My first taster course? Yeah. Back then, I was so paranoid about not making something good that um, I nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so hard to make myself do something ugly because my my husband was still alive and he would I was afraid he would walk by and see what I had done <laughs> I would have to explain uh, so it was pretty traumatic uh, it's taken me uh, three years to get to the point where it doesn't bother me at all so I posted my ugly painting this morning in Facebook and said behold ugly painting <laughs> oh I must have missed, I missed that. it then I listed the things I didn't like and the things I did like. There were only two things I didn't like about it. And there were six things I did like about the experience. So yeah. it's definitely worth it. It's so interesting what you say about almost having a heart attack. Though when I first invented the taster course and like thought, what are the assignments going to be? And, and how can I lead people through this? I thought when I thought of that one, I was like the evil villain in a James Bond movie. I was like cackling to myself, oh, this one's gonna get people. <laughs> because oh. it's I've got I've I'm gonna have a quick chat about all the reasons why it's so powerful. Um, because we did I, I sent that extra video out when I realized there were not everybody, lots of people understood what it was all about right away and got right into it, but lots of other people 
were really kind of, I'm sorry, but I just do not get the reason for doing this. And so I made that extra video, which is a lot of the things that I would normally say on tonight's call, but I wanted to get it out to give people a chance to have another go if they were struggling with it. And it's so interesting with this course because it's a different group every year and different dynamics, different issues come up. Um, so I just like to respond to those in the moment as they come up. But I put together some notes before we started, just some basic ideas about what this assignment is about. And um, these are my notes, and then we can get into questions and talk about it further. We're going to really try, and we might slip up here, but Heather, I think we should try to keep to questions related to what's happening in the free course, because often people ask questions about our art practices or how, you know, how we use sketchbooks or all sorts of different things, which it'd be lovely if in eight days we could share everything we know, but it gets us off track. And I think sometimes prevents the learning that could happen if we stick to what we're here to talk about. Um, so it doesn't matter if we slip up and answer something that isn't directly related, but it'd be nice if we could try and stay on that. So if you have a question for us, if you type question in capital letters before your question, that really helps us because you all chat to each other in the comments and help each other, which is great. But as we scroll through, we can't always see the questions. Already had one come in, so I took a screenshot of that so I can get back to it. Okay, brilliant. So I'll try and keep this short, but in in I thought of all of the different kind of ideas I had for this assignment, and it it has to come in the third ass assignment because it's too much for the first one. I think you would have all run away if I asked you to do this in the first day, but look how far so many of you have come that you could actually face it. But the assignment isn't not every assignment I give you in this free course or in my full course is about directly finding joy. It's about doing the work that needs to be done to clear the path so you can see your way to the joy. So this particular assignment is about initially learning how you feel about failure, seeing what emotions come up for you and understanding and this is so important that those emotions that came up are there every single time you go to make art. So if you loved it and you felt free and happy, it's about noticing how unfree and how unhappy maybe you've been feeling when you make your work. Um, if you felt annoyed by having to make something ugly or depressed, it's about checking in to see whether you often feel annoyed or depressed about failure when you're working. So there's nothing inherently wrong with you if you don't like making ugliness, by the way. I don't think most of us as artists, we like to make things that are aesthetically pleasing in some way or another. There's nothing wrong with you if you're like, ugh, I don't like doing this. But did you recognize a feeling that you have often when you're working, a feeling of, pushing something away because it's not right, a feeling of failure um, that is dogging you all the time. That's one of the reasons to do this exercise. If it brought up that emotion, sorry, if it brought up emotion, this was one of my notes and I'm forgetting what I wrote down. If it brought up emotion in you, like some people had a very powerful emotional experience when they do this, if that happened, it's about understanding that perhaps until now you have not been putting that emotion into your artwork. You've been holding back. And this exercise lets some of that come out. So to recap that first point, it's not about finding joy. It's about learning, watching what's going on inside you and recognizing where that might be hampering you in your art making. Because Almost everyone taking this course chose it when they saw it come up on Facebook or Instagram or wherever. You chose it because you felt, oh, that might be what I need. If you felt that might be what I need, you feel something is missing. And what is that thing? Is Did this exercise help you to see what, what might be stopping you from getting to that thing? As Heather said, <clears throat> for her, it felt like, ah, 
I don't want to do that because she didn't like to fail. She was trying to be good and she didn't want her husband to see a failure. So even that reaction, even if you don't do the exercise, it shows you what's happening inside. But it's about other things other than recognizing what's going on. It's also about idea generation. And I was just listening to a podcast interview with a, an art critic, and he was saying, even in the worst painting, there's often something that you realize, oh, I like that. I like that little bit of yellow in that left-hand corner. I've never seen that particular kind of yellow before. I like that. And when we are deliberately making things which are bad or that that don't um, conform to the traditional standards of beauty, so we therefore don't have to bother trying, we often generate ideas And so some people have said, oh, I didn't like my painting, but I did love this shade that I mixed or I did love the way this this texture that I created. And you want to take those little seeds away and try it somewhere else. So I always say make 10 more. Like if you got ideas from that one, imagine how many ideas you'd have if you did that every time you went into your studio for 10, 15 minutes and just made a mess and think, oh, look what happened. It's that freedom that generates ideas. So that's number two. Number three, it's also, it's about seeing your true self reflected back to you. This doesn't happen for everyone the first time you do this exercise, but I know it happened for some of you where you look at it and you think, well, it's kind of ugly, but actually I like it. And you like it because it feels like you. And there's something in it there that you can see that is your authentic self that has gone into it or a piece of your authentic self. Because we are many, many things, all of us, and we only ever put bits into a, one painting. But it's it's nice to get that little zing of, oh, this feels like me, even though it might be ugly and not right. And I wouldn't actually put it up for sale, although we have had people sell their ugly paintings already. Finally, this assignment, and I'm so proud of you all because this assignment is also about getting the experience of publishing something on the internet that isn't your best work and feeling the exposure of that and doing it anyway. And I know many of you felt a bit vulnerable when you hit the post button, whether that's on Instagram, because lots of you are, are doing this on Instagram, or whether it's on Facebook. You felt like, what are people going to think of me? Like Heather said, what what will they think when they see what I'm up to? That is a powerful lesson just in itself, because when we get to the point where we feel free to post anything, whether we think it's good or bad or we don't know, often I don't know. Is this good? Is it bad? Is it will people like it? I have no idea because I'm so in my own world making it. So I'll put it out there and see what people think and I'm not really bothered either way but I used to be and I want you to have that practice of posting something that feels a bit vulnerable so well done everybody for doing that (coughs) and the one last thing that I, I made a point to mention before I get to the questions which is circling back to this idea of letting go experimenting having fun Why does it work? Why is it important to do? Because I saw a comment that said, I I, I've really enjoyed this, but I can't get I can't wait to get back to making my serious art. And I was like, hmm, I I I don't think I don't see them as two separate things. The reason why working this way works, letting go of a need for a result. Here's another way that I've thought of explaining it. The art that sells and the art that's admired by other people is unique. That's why we really, some art really speaks to us. We've never seen anything quite like that before and it grabs our attention. Now, every single person is unique. Every single person watching this live stream, everyone watching the recording, everyone doing the course, you're all completely unique. So if we were simply putting our unique selves onto the canvas, we would make art that other people wanted to buy. Not everyone, 
but some subset of people on earth would respond to what we did if we were simply allowing our unique selves to be translated onto a canvas. But there are very few people who live life as their true or authentic self. Perhaps you know someone who does. I think we all maybe know someone or have known someone and they stand out. We remember them because, yeah, they're really, they they don't um, act for anybody else. They just put themselves as, here I am, as I am, love me or not. And most people do love you if you are unique, authentic selves. But we mostly, most of us blunt our edges and smooth off the, the sharp bits in order to coexist with other people. That's not wrong or right. It just is what we do. But in art, what we need to learn is how to get past all that conditioning and trying to please other people and trying to rub along to get back to putting our unique selves into the artwork so that it has that effect where other people go, ooh. And it's important to realize those other people might not be the people you know personally. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, Almost no one in my circle of friends or family likes my artwork. If I was looking to them to judge me, then I'd have a very low opinion of what I'm doing. But thankfully, there's a whole world out there of people and there's enough of them who do like what I'm doing that I don't have to care what my family and friends think. Um, They've got their own preferences about things that are just different from mine. So... That is why it's so important. We want to get you unfiltered from from your soul onto canvas or board or paper. And these exercises are the beginning, baby steps into that. And what I spend my time teaching in my full course or in my membership group is all the different ways into doing that, because it takes time for many of us. It took me a while. And um, this is like the beginning so you can see what's possible for you. So that's all I had in my initial notes. You mentioned you had a question, Heather, that you were saving. Do you want to tell me what that one was? Okay, I'll have to go in and find it here. <clears throat> oh, my goodness, I've saved so many. Uh, the, the first question I found was a bit strange maybe but how can you find a painting ugly when there are a few bits that you do like exactly exactly so this is a good point because I noticed some people really overthinking this exercise and that's not to criticize you because we all do this from time to time but again if you found yourself analyzing and overthinking this exercise Think about where you might analyze and overthink when you're making your art normally. I bet you do because it's all and I bet you do in life as well, because usually art mirrors life. So you set out to make an ugly painting. We could have called it a bad painting. And people started questioning, well, is art ever ugly? And well, am I trying to really make it ugly or if it gets nice, can I keep it nice? And I, I don't want to answer those questions in the assignment because I want you to find your own way with that but the point is as I mentioned in the in the intro often when you're when you let go of control and you let go of worrying about being good you you find what Bob Ross used to call happy accidents and those happy accidents are what you're describing and that is exactly why it's valuable to do this or one of the reasons why, because if you do this as a regular practice, as I do, what happens is you keep discovering something new and I take photos. I put those photos in my sketchbook. I write a few notes because then it's embedded in my head. And then usually I just forget about it. Sometimes I go, you know what? I really enjoyed that so much. I'm going to do it again and again and again. And I might spend a few days like that and more ideas come. So you find finding your artist's voice is about finding those little bits of paintings that you really like and then following that or saving it somehow. And, you know, just just it's like little breadcrumbs guiding you on the way. I had a, a happy accident exactly like that in my ugly painting. Uh, I used colors that I don't like and one is burnt umber and the other one is cad cad red and I had 
the red down and it had dried. And then I smeared burnt umber over the top of it with a palette knife. And I looked at it and thought, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. That's a cool effect. I like that. So uh, uh, I'll do what you said. I'll take a little picture of that and keep that. So as a reminder, because I might want to use that somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And it's just what you said then. It's, oh, that feeling. It's a little, that's how we know it's a little joy isn't like happy happy dance dance you know uh, it's more like little fizzes of excitement oh yeah oh that feels like me and that's colors I don't like I, I was surprised yeah exactly um I had a question here from Ingrid on YouTube I like realism and abstraction is it okay to go from one to the other absolutely absolutely Ingrid there are loads of famous artists who do both um, there are loads of normally, you know, are not famous artists who do both. You just do you and see and see what emerges over time. And especially when you're towards the beginning, everybody does all sorts of things you should be doing. Um, just looking for a question here. Cindy says, my painting was so ugly that now I look at it, I wonder if I was supposed to make an ugly composition or just an ugly painting. Whatever you did, Cindy, is totally fine. Like I said in that intro, I just wanted you to have the experience of making something when the objective wasn't to make something good. And I'm attacking it from different angles each day um, because some people respond better to the squares exercise. Some people respond better to ugly painting. Everybody's different. We've got another assignment tomorrow morning, our last assignment of this free course, and that one's different again. And some people will prefer that one. You're not going to love every assignment. Um, I have um, I have one here that might, it's a technical question, but I don't know if it um, relates. Uh, Julie asks, if you choose not the off primary three colors, what are the three primary shades? Um, personally, I'm, I'm a big fan of primary yellow, primary blue, and primary magenta. And those are the ones that I use most. Mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah, is that the question? What are, if you're not doing off? What are the, uh, if you're not using off primary three colors, what are the three primary shades? Yes, so it's supposed to be magenta, cyan, blue. Right, which is primary cyan. Yeah, and um, what is the yellow you use? Just primary <laughs> yellow. Yellow, I think they just call yeah. it yellow. And with those colors, like you will get a vast range. People think it's red, blue, but it's actually magenta and cyan as are the true primaries. Um, so if, if you want to do that, you can also have a palette, which is a warm, a warm and a cool of each color, but that's a bit beyond this class. Cause we get into that when we get into the full course, it gets a bit more complicated. <clears throat> Corey's asked, is it beneficial to take art courses that define the materials and the subject taking you through step by step? This feels very different. Love the feeling. So there's your answer right there, Corey. I think for some people that can be beneficial, but you've just said that you love how this feels. So for you, it's I think you would find that very constraining. I, I've done that. Have you ever done that, Heather, taken a class where they tell you exactly what to do? Oh, I have, and it was very disappointing. Um, that wasn't what I wanted at all. So yeah. I, I, I did a I few remember. And then just left. Yeah, I, I went to a class before I got back to painting seriously. When I was living in New York, I went to this, found this class in the afternoons and it was watercolors. And I walked in and everybody was sitting around. She said, right, pick a photograph out of this box and then we're going to paint the photographs. And the photographs were all like a nice harbor with boats bobbing in them or a beautiful stream meandering through a field. And then you were just to sit and copy the photograph. And I was like, no. And I rang up my husband and said, I know I've paid for this, but actually I think I'm going to come home because I really don't like it. And I just left. I said I was going to the loo and I just left. <laughs> um, but I didn't know what I was looking for at that time. I just knew, oh, this doesn't feel good. So I think, well, sorry, go on, Heather. Well, I was going to say I'm... Um pretty well self-taught and I did that I copied photographs for 20 years 
And I was good at it. And they made some lovely paintings, but it became so frustrating because it wasn't coming from in here. Yes. It was somebody else's photograph and I was making a nice rendition of it, but that just wasn't enough anymore. Yes, exactly. So I do think, Corey, that there are technical things you need to know to be able to paint the way you want to paint. So when we do the 12 week course, we do, I think it's four weeks of experimenting, exploring crazy things like we've been doing here, but on a deeper level. And then we start edging into how do you use color? Some, some like I, I have these ways of teaching things that can be complicated, like color and composition and tonal values. And I, I, try and simplify it to the point that you can apply it in any situation and you have this I call it a toolbox that you can carry through life to use in any situation in your painting so you will always know how to make your colors work you will always know how to fix a composition that doesn't feel right to you but I'm never giving you here's how to use your paints Here's how much water to put in. And the reason for that is that we are all different. So if you ask me, what's your favorite brush to use and your favorite paper and your favorite consistency of paint? And I tell you, you will very likely not have great results because they won't be your favorites. They're my favorites developed over quite a long time of practicing And they suit me, unique individual me. And when you, unique individual you, try and use things I've developed over years, it doesn't give you anything. And that's why those courses where the teacher teaches you what to do, I think they can be really damaging, actually. I went on a three-day one with a very, very good landscape painter from the UK, very admired painter who I love his work. And He just showed us how to do what he does, but it didn't suit me. And so when I left there, I was a bit thrown off for for weeks, actually. I couldn't do my own work anymore because I had his voice in my head. But when I did what he suggested, it didn't work for me because that's his process. So what I want you to do is to find your own way. And that means playing with lots of water in paint, a little bit of water, uh, no water, using as many different tools as you can find to work with and see which ones you like. And then combining that with a knowledge of color and composition, which you can learn from wherever you want to learn that stuff from. That's, that's basic stuff that all our teachers teach. We just teach it in different ways. But the most important thing is this sense of exploration. Uh, quite a few people on YouTube saying how much they loved their ugly paintings, which is exactly, you know, exactly amazing. I just want to say to Alexandra, I only get four to five reactions on what I post, so I feel it's totally rubbish. That uh, is not the case. So when you post on the Facebook group, it just depends how many people see it. Some posts are only seen by four or five people. Some posts are seen by lots of people. There's lots of reasons behind that. The more text you put in your post, the more people will respond to it. The more emotional what you write is or or explanatory what you write is, the more people will respond to it. The more you've already posted in the group and now you're posting again, the more it will get shown to people. There's all sorts of things that affect the responses and you mustn't take that to mean your painting didn't resonate with other people or they don't like it because it's just not true. It's just what happens in Facebook. But I love having the Facebook group because, again, it's good practice in the life of an artist. Sometimes I post things on Instagram that I don't particularly even really like and they get an amazing response. Then sometimes I'm really proud of something I put it on Instagram, crickets. Nobody likes it except me. That's that's what it's like, right, Heather? It's just it's absolutely what it's right, what it's like. And you just have to, I just have to learn to be, if I'm happy with it myself, it doesn't matter what other people think. Now I'm in I'm in the enviable position of being comfortably retired. I don't have to sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I 
um, if I end up with too many paintings and nowhere to put them, I'll give them away to my husband's grandchildren. It's fine. Uh, but it's still how you feel about yourself. And it, it really isn't anything that relates to anybody else. It's, it's how did I feel good about this painting? And if I did, then that's all that matters. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, question, a couple of questions on YouTube and then we'll go back to Facebook. Sue says, do you think this experimentation works as well in oils? Absolutely, Sue. I know so many painters who work in oils. I know no successful painters who don't experiment, whatever media they use. I don't know one single successful artist who doesn't experiment all the time. And the last question I was going to pick up here for now is, Teresa says, and this isn't this isn't part of the, sh the short course, but I've picked it now. So I want to paint scenes, but be able to capture the atmosphere and emotion of the place. Any pointers for this? Yes. You need to go on the artist's journey now. You need to now find out how to do that. This is a really serious point that the job of an artist is to ask yourself a question set yourself a challenge and then go figure it out. And I always joke that we we go into our studios to answer questions that no one asked us and no one cares about the answer. It's like, how do I, how do I create emotion and atmosphere in the landscape? Um, I, I wonder, nobody's asked you that. Nobody's going to grade you on it. Nobody cares about the answer except you. But that's your job now as an artist is to go figure that out. And that requires the experimentation. So that requires, I wonder if I do it by using different colors. I wonder if I do it by the way, the sizes that I paint. I wonder if I do it by composition. Go in and study an artist who do what you want to do and looking at what they're doing. Taking courses that teach you the principles of art. Maybe you know those already, I'm not sure, but you must understand color and composition and tone. Um, and even mark making, if you want to make something that does what you want it to do, because you have to understand how those things work. But other than that, it's a case of experimenting, trying different things. Does it work in charcoal? Does it work when I draw it? Does it work when I paint in watercolor? Does it work on paper? What happens if I put paper all over the floor and then work with a stick? What happens if I fling paint from a tin? just figuring it out for yourself and that is your job now so there is no body who can give you the answer because that's what I was saying earlier if I tell you oh here's how I do it this is how I create atmosphere it won't work for you because it's what I learned and worked out for myself based on all my personality traits and background and existing skills and the place where I live it, it won't work for you you've got to find Something that um, plays into this business of constant problem solving, Louise, I think is important because there are a lot of us who are uh, getting into our senior years mm -hmm. and maintaining brain health is really important. Yes. And one of the ways you maintain brain health, health is to stay creatively engaged. And this constant problem solving means that we're, we are forging new neuron connections in our brain all the time. So um, paint is never wasted. It's an investment in our, in our continued mental health and the time is never wasted. I um, love that, yeah. So important and you know, I'm 75 and I don't know um, any better way to stay mentally healthy than to stay creatively engaged. Yeah. Yes, perfect. I love that. I didn't even think to say that, but it's so true. And we've there's a book, Your Brain on Art, um, which is uh, two scientists, two Californian scientists who studied the impact of art and creativity on the brain. And not just doing it, by the way, also looking at it, discussing it, experiencing art. But particularly making our and like you say solving problems and the impact on our brain health is incredible and actually can be observed in real time like the drop in cortisol which is a stress hormone that can be seen on MRI scans the minute someone starts to create um 
all of these, so many, I mean, I'm terrible with science. So a lot of the, what I read is now gone, but it was uh, the, what I took away from the book is don't ever stop creating. If I ever found out I just can't paint anymore for some reason. Go find something else creative to do because it's really good for us. Brilliant point. What questions do you have from Facebook, Heather? What What is in I there? One here now. I've been taking these as screenshots, so mm -hmm. when it says "see more," I can't do that now because it's a screenshot. But I have one here from Kunstmala, which may be the wrong pronunciation. She asks, I have problems with being aware of what happens inside me during the work as I get so absorbed in the process. That's all that, that shows on my screenshot here, but I, that's a pretty good question in itself. Yeah, I mean, th there's not necessarily a problem with that. You know, that sounds great. If you're absorbed, this is one of the brain health benefits that Heather was mentioning is when we become absorbed it's called being in a state of flow and that's when the stress hormones reduce and all sorts of positive things happen in our bodies so you don't have anything to notice in that sense you are absorbed you are happy you are getting the the feeling that you should have the only pe the only people who need to be aware and notice is those who are feeling uncomfortable inside themselves with one of the assignments or one or more if you're feeling in flow and happy, then you are, that's it. Stick with that, follow that feeling. I suggested to somebody in Facebook that they put a little sign beside their palate, a little reminder to say, what am I feeling? Do I like this? What don't I like? And yes. it's just a reminder to think about it. Yes. If you're not sure what you're feeling, you can always work out what you liked later when you look at it. Like, hmm, do you? do you did that do you like that bit of yellow do you hate that dark red there and just noticing um will this facebook group continue or be gone no the facebook group will go once the free course goes so will the content what happens to the free course content is it goes into the full course and stays there as bonus for anyone who's taking that but it goes away because it's very much a guided course. It doesn't work by without us, to be honest. Um, it does for some people, but for a lot of people, they need us. So this goes and, and we can't manage it. We can't go on managing it all year. Um, a question from Carolyn. Who go says, on. Should we keep doing these exercises, all of them? Will it help in the long term? Yes. So this is what I've been trying to say. So this is, this is, it's not, does it help in the long term? It's that this is it. This is what it is to be an artist, to experiment and to play. I mean, these are just four exercises. We have, we have a lot more and also other people have a lot of ideas of what you can do. So go have a look on YouTube or wherever and see what else you can find. It's, it, it's not that it helps, it's that it is the whole ball game. There isn't anything else that helps. So if if you think there's a way to learn how to make strong art without doing this, I would love to know what that way is because I've never seen anyone do it. It really is the path to where you want to go is through this approach. Um, I've got one here on Facebook from Sat. I'm going to say this wrong. I'm so sorry. Satya Priya. And I really apologize for butchering that. But you said with no real drawing experience and no traumatic events in life to draw from, I feel I'm lost in being able to pull inspiration from my deeper self. I loved doing the ugly assignment as I didn't have the need to show for something that people need to like. Sadly, I did uglier paintings when trying to do pretty ones. Where do I even start with wanting to do art? Or should I be giving up the hope totally? No, you must not give up hope. You are so at the beginning. And the only inspiration isn't traumatic events. It is it, it, Inspiration can be, I mean, there's an artist called Brian Rutenberg, R-U-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. And I talk about him a lot because he's written books about his process and so it, I know a lot about his process and he's inspired by his 
very happy childhood in South Carolina, growing up in South Carolina. He's inspired by heat and humidity and mud and swamps and uh, live oaks. And he just paints abstracted trees. He's done it for years and years and years. Your inspiration does not have to be trauma or sadness, but you it's a process to find out what your inspiration is. And it's a process. So you say, should I just give up? When you've made 500 paintings, when you've painted every day for half an hour or every other day for half an hour for, for years, and then you can say whether you can should give up or not. But for people to start painting and then a few weeks later say, oh, maybe I should just give up. It's kind of an insult, although I don't take it that way, but it's a bit of an insult to say that what we do, the professional artists among us, is so easy that I should be able to pick it up and start doing it in a few weeks. Um, it, it, you wouldn't think that about being a doctor, for example. I was seeing a surgeon this morning with my mom. Nobody would think that he should be able to do surgery after two weeks of medical school. Um, and, and so you've got to give yourself time. You've got to give yourself practice. You've got to treat this seriously. It's a serious pursuit. And then you will find everyone can find their way to making interesting art. Um, I have, a, I, oops, I lost it. <laughs> I'm just looking at questions while you look for one, Heather. Um, I'm one here. I have one. Um, uh, the question is, uh, and you've really answered it, but it might be worth saying again, why so much focus on feelings? There are other liberating aspects to creating skills, for instance. I don't think I have focused on feelings. I think, I don't think I have focused on feelings, but skills for me, as I explained at the beginning, skills are very easily taught and very easily learned. And, and I teach a lot of those things in YouTube. I teach those things in Art Tribe. Other people teach those things. It's very easy to show someone, look, here's how to hold the brush. Here's how to put this much medium into this much paint and get this effect. Here's, here's how to make a good composition. Here's how color works. Those are factual things that you can teach people. And we include a lot of that in the full course. But the reason why I don't do the, the taste of leading off with those things is that I've seen too often in courses that do teach that stuff that it leaves people behind. What happens is they learn the skill or the principle and then the course ends and they go, oh, right, now what? Like the teacher told me what to do, but I don't know where to take it. Or I'm completely frozen by this idea of composition that they've taught me and I don't know what to do with it because I haven't sourced who I am. I haven't got in touch with my inspiration, what I love before I get into that. So the taste, of course, the idea behind this is to just give you an idea, just show you and hopefully inspire you as to what can happen if you let yourself go and learn and explore. So my focus isn't feelings. My focus is getting you to let go of the need to make good paintings so you can go explore and discover who you are and discover what's possible for you and make mistakes and learn from it. And I call it working like an artist. I want to show you how artists work, real artists work people who make money at it call it real artists or professional artists or what you want everyone you admire who's an artist I want to show you how they explore and experiment and then if you decide yeah this is fun I really want to know more now you can some skills you teach yourself some skills you learn from other people but you've got a basic grounding of self-confidence in having the freedom that when they teach you a rule of composition, you don't feel like a fool experimenting with it. You don't feel too stupid to share your attempts with the class because you now know it's okay whatever you do. So that is my philosophy. It's not everyone's and it might not be yours and that's fine. But this, this is what I believe and what I spend all my time teaching people. 
There might be an analogy with musical training as a as a retired musician. Uh, I can vouch for the fact that um, pr training a, a young pianist, you have to teach them how to move the fingers and where the keys are and, and how to read music and all of that stuff. Those are the absolutely basic skills, like how do you hold a brush in your hand and how do you take the, tube, the top off the tube, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I've known so many musicians who play note perfect, absolutely technically perfectly, and the music is dead inside. There is no yeah. in it. So I agree with your approach not to go straight at it from skills because they're how can you teach somebody to open their heart through the music or through the art if you don't at least put some focus on it? Yes. Yes. I love that analogy because you see it in all that. Like with the ugly paintings, I was scrolling through the group while I was at the hospital this morning. I was looking at all the paintings and I was going alive, not alive, alive didn't put any didn't like the exercise like you can just see you can see who let themselves go and who didn't enjoy it or did it really quickly or struggled or and there's nothing wrong with the people who struggle by the way learning is about doing things and then not doing it well and then doing it well but it's very visible this feeling in art just like you said about music we can see it and we know it when we see it it might be ugly but it feels alive um there was a couple of questions back here uh, on Facebook about, um, can I describe Art Tribe? I will talk about that later and give you all the information. I don't want to do that here, but it's a membership group with ongoing education, which is different from my courses. So it's not a, co a, a course, is a A to Z, like we're starting here and we want you to get here at the end. And a membership is more ongoing inspiration. Julie asked, is there any overlap and link with the full course in what we're doing now? There's no overlap. We don't repeat things, but there's a very, very clear link. This free course is the foundation. It's like we've built the foundations and now we can lead you in to the next level of learning on that course. So it's really important. Pam had a great suggest uh, analogy. It's the same with cooking. You need to know what your tools do and how your ingredients taste before you create amazing dishes. That's a good analogy. And then go for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just going to pop back to YouTube. Oh, somebody asked if they can do this course, the full course, at a different time. Sadly, no. It's it's a lot of work for us. There's a whole teamwork on it for 12 weeks, but there's another three months before that, maybe four months for me getting ready. So it takes half my year. So no, this is it for this year. And I've said that this is the last time it will run in this format. I don't know what it's going to change into yet. This is the life of an artist, right? I know I can't keep keep doing the same thing every year without wanting to change something. I don't know what's going to change, but that is uh, this 12 weeks is it for this iteration of Find Your Joy. Um, if you have that question, Christina, about uh, my course versus another course, just email us, find your uh, FYJ team, team, not T, people keep thinking SAT, find your joy, FYJ team at gmail.com. And the coaches, many of the coaches who work with me and answer emails have done both courses so they can answer that for you. Um, Taster course probably won't be here next year. So to answer that question. Um, just going back to see if I can find any more. If you have anything, just shout them out, Heather. Well, there's one here. Question. Uh, when are you entitled to call yourself an artist? Is it when you feel like one or when you sell work? <laughs> I very rarely sell work. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Somebody in the group said that they called themselves an artist. And I think it was their sister laughed at them. And they felt really you know, knocked back by that. And what I find is when we start to step into a new version of ourselves, some of the people around us don't like it. Like mm. you, you're changing now. You've been this person and now you're changing to something else. Maybe you've been the, 
the boring one and now you're getting interesting or maybe you've been the quiet one and now you're starting to be creative what's this all about maybe you be maybe i think of myself as the creative one and now my brother says he's going to be an artist huh that's you can't be an artist i'm an artist um maybe a spouse gets threatened when they see you start to change or a partner maybe you might leave them there's people react in funny ways when we say that so that's the first thing to say and you do have to kind of be ready for that not everyone lots of people are just really supportive and happy for you but and also I find it's funny the reactions you get um if people say what do you do and I say I'm an artist when I wasn't confident in myself people would respond to my lack of confidence in it they'd say no but really you know like what do you really do it's your day job so yeah that. yeah but I mean how do you make money um but but now that I'm like I just say it actually no one ever questions it they just go oh right my dentist said one day oh that sounds relaxing and <laughs> I said well not really <laughs> not the way I do it anyway but so the the answer is when you feel you can say it uh, when I talk about professional artists I don't really mean anything by that other than people who make a living from their art I suppose that's what I mean but an artist you are an artist because you're here you are an artist you were born an artist because you're this interested in this and I want to I want to I wish I could get all of you to see that and bring that out in yourselves because it's amazing um, I will answer all questions about the full course after the last Q&A, but one question Christine's got is, I'm confused, find your joy full course and art tribe out there the same thing? No. So, um, and everybody don't get grumpy, people start asking questions, that's okay. <laughs> um, P P I or PL, sorry, I'm not sure what that says, a friend called me arty farty and it wasn't a compliment. Oh yeah, I get called that all the time. I, yeah, I get called that all the time by people around here. Where I live, it's very rural, very conservative with a small C. I don't mean politically, but just people are quite conservative in their attitudes. And um, I was walking my dog once and the guy was doing something inside the road and he we got into conversation. He said, what do you do? I'm an artist. Oh, what kind of painting? And I said, abstract. And he said, oh, just daubs then. So I was <laughs> like... All right. Well, yes, if you want to call it that. <laughs> um, Experiment 626 on YouTube says, I heard my husband tell one of his friends, my wife is an artist. Wow. Then I really felt like an artist. It's so nice when you've got the support of a spouse or partner or family members. Um Eight years to be able to call myself an artist. Um, and you were the one who taught me to do that. But ah, I, didn't, interesting. I didn't feel um, I felt it was presumptuous of me because that was not my training because I'd had so much training as a musician. Uh, it felt, um, I don't know, somehow not right yet to call myself an artist, but but I, I'm, I'm getting pretty good at it now. <laughs> uh, when I wasn't comfortable, I used to say painter. I'm a painter. That yes. was first. That's and then people, people would say, what, like houses? And be like, no. <laughs> paintings <laughs> um and that is you know once you and this comes with time <clears throat> excuse me everybody I've got something in my throat once you get confident in 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 your work and or just in your journey that you're on you you when you're curious and experimenting and answering questions to yourself in your studio and solving problems it starts to get easier to say these things. You don't have to make a big leap. You just have to say it once or twice and see how it feels. It gets easier when you when you you know say it more often. Um, I'm just looking. Paula says it's not important to me to be considered an artist, uh, which is fine. Again, you know we're all different, so some people just don't care. For me, I think being an artist was the highest thing I could imagine. Like, I think that was what my problem was. All through my life when I was a kid, you know, if you were an artist, oh, my God, what a life is that? You were some kind of esoteric being living this amazing life that I could only dream of. 
And so it was very hard for me to use that word about myself. And I really wanted to, but it isn't. I remember actually, I met this woman in my twenties and she worked in a bank and I, she said, what would you be if you could be anything? And I, I said, an artist. And she said, oh, I'd be a venture capitalist. And I was like, really? And I, I remember thinking, wow, so not everyone wants to be an artist. I didn't realize that. <laughs> I, thought, I thought we all wanted that, but we were doing other things. But no, she had no interest. When um, I was a kid, I thought everybody had a piano in their house. <laughs> yeah I never did <laughs> <laughs> I have a question here if you're if you're ready for one yeah yeah Carrie asks once you've recognized your blocks how do you go about moving past them I love starting but I tend to get frozen in the middle I always get to a point where I get stuck and don't know what to do I'm thinking my block is I don't want to mess it up I know what you're going to say mess it up <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> and that's what I do but I just can't seem to finish anything I think this is a bit of a complex question because there can be lots of reasons for this so you you're right you've already taken my first piece of advice but often how do we know when something's finished I don't think I just think you haven't pushed it far enough yet and what I mean by that is I know when something's finished when it meets my intention for it now we're not all the same we don't all work with an intention but I need to have something I'm focusing on when I'm working it might be as simple as I want to work with this limited palette for this series and I want to make these colors look as amazing as possible or it might be I want to create a series of abstract landscapes that have a feeling of drama or it might be, I just want to experiment and explore and push charcoal as far as it can go. But I need some kind of hook or else there's too many possibilities and I can I could go on forever. Sometimes I start, like I said, I start ugly and then I start working out an intention as I go. So maybe something in the ugliness tells me, oh, I'm going to make this a painting where lime green is a really big star of the painting and then I'm going to see how I can make that happen um but without some kind of reason why what can happen is we get very bogged down in the middle because we don't know where to guide it but also often paintings have what's called I call the ugly teenager stage where they just look awful and we don't know what to do with them because they're right in the mushy middle and the best thing to do is to keep going until something, if you work in the way I do, something grabs your attention and makes you say, oh, I like that. Maybe I'll follow that thread. I think often when people say I ruined it, I messed it up, what, what they're actually saying is I didn't go far enough. I haven't actually got to a place where it was strong enough because you wouldn't have kept working on it if you were happy with it. If you were happy with it, you would have stopped. So keep going, but also, and again, you don't need this at the beginning or even in the first few years of painting, it comes with time. Just keep noticing why you're doing what you're doing. Keep thinking about that. Keep journaling about that. What, why is the reason why you paint? And then um, recognizing that it's okay if you don't have an intention yet, it's okay if you just keep going and see if something shows up. But one of the things we do in that full course is we we start talking about intention towards the end. And I'll do a video about what we cover. But when we start talking about intention, it's towards the end of the course, because I think it's too soon to be thinking about that before you have all the mindset stuff and all the skill stuff under your belt. And then you can start thinking about intention. It's too hard. It's great having an intention. But if you don't have the skills, you won't know how to make your intention happen if that makes sense um there's a question here which is about the full course but i'm going to answer it because it's a broader question lorraine says in the full course is there any opportunity to critique work done so no and there's a very very um def uh, definite reason for that like that's a deliberate on my part some courses will critique work and make suggestions for what people should do 
I really, really disagree with that at the stage of exploration and experimentation because no one can know the answers, only you. And every single time when I was learning that someone gave me feedback, it completely derailed me. I didn't know what to do with it. Whether it was positive or negative, it sent me off uh, uh, on just the wrong path. And in my teaching, we're not focused on getting it right, on improving the composition to the point where it's perfect, on getting the perfect color mix. And I'm not interested in telling you how to make your art. I want to help you find your way to your own decisions. I like that. I don't like that. I never understand when I see people on social media asking people, what do you think of my painting? or I've got this far, what should I do now? Those people don't know you or your intentions or what you're expressing or what you want from your art. So asking them is completely pointless. So while I know critique is big in the art world and lots of people do it, it is not a part of my course. But what is a part of anything I teach is teaching you how to be your own critic and your own supporter your own guidepost so you don't need anybody else and then when you get to that point you're strong enough and confident enough to start maybe requesting critiques if you want advice or you want someone to bounce ideas off if you want to enter shows where you will be rejected because we all get rejected you'll have that grounding of confidence that you need um Right. I'm not answering questions about selling out because that just isn't part of the course. I apologize, but I really have to. We have to stick to what we're trying to teach. Otherwise, this could go off everywhere. Um, I have one here from Julia, if you want a question from here. Yeah. She says, do you think there is some truth in the idea that if I don't care if I spoil something, then I can't spoil it? This was sort of my experience in this exercise. I was trying to spoil it and it just refused to spoil. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Which is such a good lesson, isn't it? Like imagine if you always painted with that outlook. Imagine if that's how you went into your workspace every time. And that's what I'm hoping for you all, that you will go into your workspace with that attitude and that approach. Because how much easier is life if, if you don't, care if you're not worried I mean your art you have to both care very much because it's important to you and not care at all about specific pieces because they're just little bits of like little snowflakes in a massive great big sky full of snow um P. Maroney says, to loosen up and stay away from results, I'm wondering if I should work on a specific technique and just do it, do it, do it. Otherwise, I tend to get lost in what next. That would be a great experiment to do for yourself and just see. Um, For me, what I like to do, like I say, is set myself limitations. And this is going to be, and tomorrow's lesson is going to be about limitation and the value of limitation. But I'm going to give you just one assignment about limitations. There are many, many ways you can limit yourself. But I agree with you with all the possibilities in the world out there. How do you decide? So I like to limit myself often to a very narrow color palette to a specific, you know, I'm going to do I'm going to work on abstract landscapes. Maybe I'm going to keep them all the same size. I'm only going to use, um, I don't know, collage, ink and charcoal for a week. I I try and limit myself so that I can explore and get the most out of each possibility. But not everyone likes to work that way. So you have to find what works for you. Um, Amy says, I am an artist and it upsets me when people say I have a hobby. This is something I can't not do it's part of who I am yeah um I we I built a studio in my garden no I didn't personally build it I had it built and um we had to ask the neighbors if they were okay with it because they would have seen some of them would have seen it and we have a few close neighbors so we went and asked and one of my neighbors next door said oh yeah that sounds lovely I should get a hobby and I was like it's not a hobby but I needed her permission so I had to just say "Mm -hmm, yes you maybe you should 
Um, do you have any more questions there on Facebook, Heather? Uh, here one, here's one that says, you have said that it's not good to paint, oops, from photographs. I have always used my own photographs, not other people's, because I know the context of the photograph, where the feeling, etc. Is that limiting? I would say, Louise, that there's a difference between using a photograph as a reference and using the entire photograph as just copying that. Isn't it? Yeah, isn't it interesting, Glenda? I never said that. I didn't say it isn't good to paint from photographs. This is an example I, I, of, of... I might have been the one that said it because I did copy photographs for years. Well, but that's it. I think we were... T that's what I mean, though. We were having a discussion, and this isn't to pick on Glenda. This is what happens when we're sensitive to something or we're trying to find the definitive answer. We hear a conversation, then we think we heard something that wasn't actually said. So we were Heather was saying she wasn't happy painting from photographs so she wanted more and I was saying I didn't enjoy the class where they gave me some preset photographs which I had no connection to and said copy that photograph like I when I do my abstract landscapes I work a lot from the photographs that I take when I'm out walking that they're, they're like references I'll have those some of them pinned up I'll also work from sketches that I do, but often I do those sketches when I get back based on photographs. I don't like sitting outside in a cold field in the wind and rain drawing. I'm terrible at it. Some people do. Um, I also work from my memory a lot because I, I work about the same area where I live, so I know it very well. But it's there's no problem. I would never say that any way of making art is wrong because there's always someone who's doing it brilliantly. It's it's whatever makes you happy. So I'm sorry if it sounded like that's what we were saying. I think we were both referring to a different experience where we were not happy. And that's always to be looking at. Am I enjoying this? Is this giving me what I want? And if it is, in fact, we had a class in Art Tribe um, all about how to find compositions in your photographs, which was taught by another artist. And that was a really good class about how to go out, photograph things that you really like looking at, and then look at what it is that's appealing to you and what how can you use that in a composition. So please keep using photographs if that is what you really enjoy doing. Even some of the most famous portrait painters in the world, I, I was watching a documentary about one guy and he paints like the royal family and people. And he has sittings, but he also, well, at the sitting, he takes loads of photographs, as does David Hockney, by the way, when he does portraits, takes lots and lots of photographs. So do whatever you want to do. Lorraine's asking, what is Art Tribe? So I guess she's not heard of it. And I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that is a membership group that I run and you'll get all the information later on. So don't worry about that. If you want to join, you certainly don't need to. But we have a free month for anyone who wants to join. And there will be a discount price for you guys. Um, but that will be coming when we get to the end of this. Pat has a question. I was enjoying what I was doing, but it became too much like an assembly line. I'm trying to move forward, but it is ugly and cannot move back. Feel frustrated and afraid I will stay here. Trying lots of different things, but nothing hits a chord. Wonder if you ever get to a point where it isn't worthwhile anymore. So I wonder, Pat, I don't know which exercise you're talking about. Um, I don't know which exercise you're talking about. But um, I, to answer your question, yes, I do get to a point where I think it isn't worthwhile anymore in certain paintings. And I just put them aside for a while. And often then I come back and find, oh. I see something I like in there, but it might be a month later or so. Um, you said you cannot move back. I, uh, it might be a good idea, Pat, to email us because I'm not sure I'm understanding your question and I don't want to cheat you out of an answer. Um, but that is, yeah, that might be a good idea. Uh, I'll just check YouTube one more time and then we should call it a day on here. Um, I can't see any more questions, but there might be questions without writing questions. So I've just got to check. 
Oh, here we go. Blue Sky Chaser. Do you think you can use someone else's photos just for proportions, but still be totally free mentally? I think you can you can use any tool and make amazing art. That's what I believe. It's all about how you use it and why you're using it. But you said use it for proportions. So are you meaning you want the thing to be accurately sized and that's an important part of your art? I mean, honestly, you can use anything. Um, I often put animals in my paintings and I, I love Google because I can find a picture of anything I want on there. But I can't yeah. make that. I can't make up the proportions of an elephant from memory. I have yes. to. So you use yeah. a photograph. Yeah. Um, one more question from Natasha, and then we must wrap this up. Natasha says, I can work so quickly that I often don't see when I like what I've done, and I end up going over it. Have you got any thoughts on what I can do to slow down? So I think you're going to have to practice this, Natasha. I can be like this too. I do this a lot. I'm, I, um, what an artist I work with quite a lot used to say to me, you make four paintings in every one painting. In other words, I would cover over what was good with another painting and then cover that over with another instead of working to refine the first one and finish it um, because I was working so quickly. And what I found helpful is to work on lots of paintings at once and to switch between them um, so that I don't have chance to like get rid of everything on one painting. And then there's a bit of a space so I can come back and look at it and think, oh, yeah, I like that. Or no, I think I want to change that. So that's something you might think about. Um, sh only allowing yourself to work for short bursts of time and then making yourself go have a cup of tea or do something else and come back another day or later on would be another way maybe. Um, do you, are you a fast uh, painter or a slow painter, Heather? Um, I'm I'm slower. I tend often, you know me, I like detail. I like small, meticulous detail. Although mm -hmm. I did something in exercise too that shocked me, but mm -hmm. uh, that's another story. But yeah, I'm fairly slow. Yes. I, as, I, I feel if I haven't spent enough time on something, um, I haven't given it the attention that it needs. But I agree with putting it away for a while because then you come back at it with fresh eyes. Yes. Uh, I'll often look at something and think, oh, that's awful. And then I'll turn it to the wall. And then three days later, I'll put it back up on the easel and go, oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It, it, your own cri critic, critic gets in there sometimes. So you have to just put it away to, to shut the critic up and yeah. when the critic has gone to sleep then you can put it back and you can look at it objectively and to go back to this week's ex today's exercise you can see that in the facebook group with a lot of people critiquing their putting their ugly painting up and saying well it's horrible and i hate it but here it is and i look at it and think oh wow i really like that and i think with a little bit of space and time, they might look at it again and say, actually, I see something in there that I like because I can see it. Um, so that is such an important point. It's a, And it's just a practice of allowing that time. And one of the things that helped me as well was I started photographing my work as I was going along. So then you can just look on your phone or on your uh, iPhotos on your computer or whatever computer you use. You can see the progress and you can see points where you went over something that was good and it's just learning I see it when I video demos so for the course and and for other things I teach I do demo videos and often watching them back when I'm editing I go oh no you should have left it right there that was the moment and that helps me again to slow down but it's all about learning ourselves learning what we like some of you will be naturally slow don't try and speed up some of you will be naturally fast maybe that's just the way you're meant to paint you know let yourself be whoever you are is my final message for today tomorrow we've got um, another exciting assignment completely different again um, perhaps less angst inducing than others for most of you but for some of you might find it challenging in a different way and that's the idea isn't it if 
you were taking a course and you weren't feeling challenged, that would be a problem. So um, that's coming tomorrow morning. And then on Friday evening, we have the final Q&A where we will discuss that assignment and answer questions about that assignment. And when we get to the end of that final Q&A, um, I'll, I'll also talk about the course that's coming and you'll also receive an email about it. So for anyone who's interested, all that's coming. But I do want to spend some time on the last Q&A, finishing the free course up and discussing the assignment that you'll be getting tomorrow. And it's, as I said, all about limitations. It's something I think each of these exercises is something you can take away and play with in various ways going forward. And the limitations one is no different. So thank you all for being here. It's been absolute joy. This video will go into YouTube and uh, Facebook and stay there. So if you want to leave comments after you can do, if you're watching this on the recording and want to leave questions or comments, that's fine. Just do so below the video and we will keep circling back. Thanks very much, Heather. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, Louise. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.